Oh. Oh. Okay, that was a good idea. Right, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Multipath TCP Part 2. Um, the blue sheet has started going round. Now, is the noise from out? Oh, somebody's shutting the door. Thank you. Um, so we need a note taker, please. Can somebody volunteer? and the Jabber monitor. You take notes, thank you, Brian. Is somebody able to keep an eye on, on Jabber? Which is very easy. At least if you're confused, let's see, do Jabber. Thanks, Mia. Uh, the note well, of course. So we had um, a good time on Monday talking about, uh, or Tuesday rather, talking about the implementation updates, uh, the BIS and some proxy stuff. Um, so I thought since there's been a lot of discussion on the list um, in the last couple of days about both the converter draft and the SOX draft, I really wanted to give people um, a chance to, to follow up uh, orally in the you know in the face to face session um, on those two drafts. So does anybody? I mean, I, there was kind of a burst of discussion which has actually died down in the last day, which m maybe implies we have some consensus on it, uh, or perhaps just implies that people have got other things to do at the moment. Um, does anybody want? I mean, I've allowed some time in the agenda basically now for people to follow up on on either of those the converter draft um or on vlad Sox v6 draft see people are still coming in so if if the if there's a moment um that people have to follow up anything so i'll tell you what my um my interpretation and the way forward. I think on the on the Sox v6 one, um, it you know that's I think that will will not be homed in this working group, um, and it was great that we we heard about it. So I think we will continue to hear about it, and I I'm assuming that it will go forward in Interior or somewhere similar. Um, so that's that's great. Um, and I think it's good that we remain in, in the discussion, but I, I don't think it's unlikely we'll be the working group leading it. Um, on the converter thing, my read of the discussion that, that happened for a, kind of on Tuesday and Wednesday in particular was quite promising and that, that people um, seem to quite like the approach uh, and the people who'd had issues on, on previous approaches, which was particularly Joe and Tom, Joe Touch and Tom Herbert. Uh, and it was great that they made lots of comments. And I I think they were probably reasonably OK. But I, I mean, we have to obviously confirm that and give people more time to, um, to read it and for others to chip in. So unless anybody wants to make any f further comments and follow up any of the points, my suggestion is that the authors of that draft um, do a rev a new version, taking account of the comments, which were lots of clarification things. Um, do, do a revision. We'll ask for comments again on uh, all the relevant mailing lists. Uh, and then we'll work out with Mia what the right 
uh, working group is to do it um, because uh, you know it obviously should be the call for the call for it to be adopted has to say um, what working group will work on it so uh, that's my suggestion of, of how we're going to go forward with it okay so if nobody wants to chip in any more on the, on the proxy work, we will move on to topic two. So topic two today um, is, a, is a new security attack, which uh, Zion and, sorry, apologize for mangling your name, um, Zion and colleagues raised a couple of days ago on the mailing list um, and this is really great that uh, they brought it forward and notified us um, and there's been some nice discussion in the last couple of days of it so but for those of you who haven't caught up i've tried to extract um, some points from the email now let me just look at meet echo I don't think the authors are on Meet Echo, um, so I will attempt to summarise uh, the problem that they raised. Um, so this concerned the MP prior message, which is, uh, and the, and the problem is that it seems to allow a man in the middle attacker on one path to divert all the traffic onto its own path, so effectively hijacking the MPTCP connection. Um, and when we were designing the MPTC protocol, there was a security assumption that it would be equivalent to, uh, or roughly equivalent to TCP security. So on-path attackers are a vulnerability for, um, for for TCP. But this is this is probably a bit worse than that. Um, and there's a little explanation there. Um, about why you would be, why you might be interested in send, sending the MP prior message uh, on another sub connection, um, and it might be that the first one you've got is already congested, so it's you know you can't really send it on that. Um, the MP prior is about uh, indicating whether one of the sub connections, one of the sub flows, is uh, kind of to be used as a backup path or 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 not. So it's a kind of mode in which you're using it. Um, so the issue really is that the MP prior option has no authentication um, required. Uh, so that's that's the vulnerability, if you like, that the this proposed attack is exploiting. Um, so the the solution that seemed to that the that Xeon and others have suggested is so the possible solution is to remove the address identifier from the option. Um, and my read of the discussion that was on the list is this was seen to not have very many uh, downsides uh, and that it would cure the issue. So we ought to have some discussion, so I'll throw open the mic. Alan. Hi, Alan Ford. So um, just to summarize a little bit more, um, MP Prio is a, a backup bit for use on other subflows, predates the fact we can do um, um, the prior bit in the MP join, so that, that's pretty much negated the point of this signal anyway. So, as far as I'm aware, there's no problem with removing this. As regards the actual attack itself, the spe the uh, scope of it is very very small in that it requires only only enough bandwidth and so on, and, and and relying on the policy of the other end to apply backup in a certain way, and requires it to be an on-path attacker, which is as I said on the list, pretty much equivalent to a TCP level attack anyway. Having said all that, not a problem to get rid of it, um, as far as I can see. So the real question to everyone is, is there any reason to change your prior priority of a subflow from another subflow? And if there's not, then we be, I feel we've cleaned, clear to get rid of it. So uh, I'll give you an answer. I think the attack is, is important in practice because uh, you have, let's consider one case where you, are, you have a smartphone and you are connected to a Wi-Fi access point and a cellular network. 
if you control the Wi-Fi access point, then you can tell with the attack that the cellular network should not be used to transmit data. So you move all the traffic over the Wi-Fi access point. And the reason is that in the MP prior option, and I, I don't remember for which reason, we have placed an address identifier in addition to the bit. And this address identifier should indicate that you would put as a backup all the subflows that are used, that are using this specific address identifier. And this is a really strange use case, and as far as I know, no implementation is doing that. So I would support the removal of the address identifier from the MP prior option. And if you remove the address identifier from the MP prior option, then you are forced to use the MP prior option on the subflow that you want to change the backup status, which means that you need to be on pass to attack this particular subflow. And I think this solves the problem, and we keep the protocol simple and usable. Any more comments? So let me ask the question, is there anybody unhappy with this proposed solution? If you're unhappy with this proposed solution, please can you hum? OK, so I heard nothing. And if you're OK with this proposed solution, please can you hum? And if you would like more time to think about it, say another week, uh, please can you hum. Okay, so for the notes I heard, uh, some humming on the happy to remove it and none on the other two. Uh, none, nobody was unhappy with removing it and nobody needed more time to ponder. So, um, Alan, as editor, can you go ahead and make the change? Thank you. Right, that's great. So, this is good. We're well ahead of time. Um, so, Marcus is up next to talk about uh, this proposed MPT robust session establishment. So, let me see if I can get your slides. Yeah, good morning. My name is Markus from the company with a magenta color, as you can see, it's Deutsche Telekom. And um, yeah, today I want to talk um, about a real existent and annoying problem we were faced um, with the standard MPTCP um, into the field. And um, yeah, my, my goal for today is um, that I can gather some feedback from your side because it's the first time for me at ITF and I'm not um, pretty familiar with the process here. so. Please support me during <clears throat> yeah, the presentation or afterwards. So can we go to the next? I think that we can skip directly and can hurry up a little bit. OK. So um, <clears throat> I have an example um, where I try to explain the problem we are faced. First, we start with the standard MPTCP. And um, we have a, you see a smartphone, and we assume that it is system-wide enabled with um, standard MPTCP. And as you know, a smartphone today has a Wi-Fi interface and a cellular interface. And um, if it tries to connect a MP-capable receiver, um, it will work like that, that it first tries to open an initial flow over or through the default, default, uh, default route. <clears throat> and if it is successful, then afterwards, um, it can open subsequent flows. So I, I think most of you know this process. And um, yeah, as, uh, as soon as uh, two succeeds, uh, the, the second point succeeds, so you have a subsequent flow, then you have multipath capabilities, which means uh, resilience and uh, possibly bandwidth aggregation. Yeah? But first, you need the first point, the initial flow. And then you need the second point, the subsequent flow, um, to have multipath. 
capabilities. Okay, next slide, please. Um, that's again um, the flow diagram um, for for the session establishment, and here you see again um, on the left side the two interfaces, A1 and A2, uh, from the smartphone, um, and on the right side the host B interface from the server. And first, we start a, the request with an MP capable for the initial flow, and if it succeeds, then on A2 we can start with an MP join. Next. Okay. What is now um, the, our problem or the motivation for our proposal for a robust establishment? What happens if the default route is not able to transmit or succeed in reaching the server in establishing an initial flow? And uh, the answer is um, pretty simple. Nothing will happen. Even if you have uh, another working path, yeah, for example, the cellular network, can not reach the destination. And that's, it's, it's a problem. So the question is always, where do you put the default route? Um, should it be on Wi-Fi? Should it be on cellular? We don't know. And at the end, at, at the end it, it, it could happen that we will never reach the destination. Or we need some mechanism which tries to detect where we have to put the default route to. Next slide. Okay, and now our demand is, or our approach is, if there's at least one functional path, a connection must be possible. That is our idea, and that I want to present now. Um, the idea is mainly based on, on uh, introducing potential initial flows, so do not have any more the concept of one initial flow and then subsequent ones. Um, we want to have potential initial flows using all paths available during uh, the establishment process and do not rely anymore on one path. And that is what you can see here now. We directly start on both interfaces potential initial flows. And even if on the default, a default route it cannot succeed, it will work over the cellular. So any path can be used to establish a connection. That is the idea. And for that, we developed um, three different proposals I want to present now. Maybe there are also some other ideas, um, but, but we try to, to make some, yeah, to develop some, some different uh, proposals um, which have, um, different kind of aspects uh, in kind of uh, robustness, in kind of um, other benefits and that I want to present now. And, and maybe then you can afterwards give me some pe the feedback which one fits best from, from your view. So, next slide, please. Okay. And that, um, to directly say, that is the preferred proposal from, from our view. And um, it's pretty simple. So what we are doing there is we establish over each path from the very beginning identical SUNs. That means we copy the, the or we duplicate the MP capable, which we send um, to host B. And um, the first flow that returns establishes a connection, which at the end resembles the initial flow concept. And the second flow, and that's what we call downgrade approach, it, we directly use and downgrade it as a subsequent flow. That means uh, that at the end guarantees robustness and overall latency reduction. Why overall latency reduction? We have um, two things in respect to, to latency. First, the quickest path enables communication. And secondly, um, we have the path, all the flows earlier available and can use them, for example, earlier for bandwidth application. Um, <clears throat> and the last point, we do not institute with this concept any kind of network overhead. Next slide. Um, the second uh, proposal is, is pretty similar to, to the first one. 
So we start again with duplicating the SUN requests for all part available. Um, but now um, there's a change uh, on host B side um, during uh, the handling of the last acknowledgement which will arrive at host B. Um, so we reset all but one. <clears throat> that means the first flow which returns on host B um, will be the initial flow and all the other ones um, are reset. Um, and then we can proceed with a standard anti-join procedure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that guarantees robustness as well. We have some latency reduction, so it's not the same as, as with a don't write approach. So the quickest part in, in game determine the, the handshake latency, handshaking latency. Um, <clears throat> but then we reset all the other one and Again, we have to use the MP join, so um, the subflows um, will not be there earlier as in the downgrade approach. Um, yeah, it's, it's then like standard MP TCP. And we um, cause additional network overhead because we have a lot of handshaking, which at the end we reset. Yeah, and um, the last proposal, is, that we call the timer solution. Um, we don't like it, but um, it has the benefit that it is full standard compliant, but compared to the two other proposals we have already seen, it is less efficient. Um, and of course, it guarantees robustness as well. What we are doing, and that is um, pretty like the happy eyeballs um, concept uh, from RFC 6555. Um, we start with a normal SYN request over the first interface, over the default route interface. And if after some time we do not have success in establishment, um, a connection to the receiver side, then we try it on another interface. And if you could um, assume that can introduce a lot of delay because we have to recognize that uh, one or several paths will not work. Imagine, for example, if we have eight paths available and only the last one work, then we have to try seven paths before um, we read the path which is working. And I'm not sure if this is a good solution, but I, I say it again, it's full standard compliant from, from my view. Um, <clears throat> yeah, next slide. Okay, again, um, a comparison. Um, we start on the left column with the downgrade approach. So it's most efficient in, in terms of um, robustness, overall latency reduction, and I think that is a huge benefit also compared to, to the standard MPTCP. And we do not introduce any additional network overhead for such, a, such an approach. Um, but it needs sender and receiver modifications, possibly some standard extension, and there I'm, I'm pretty sure that we need some standard extension for um, such an approach. And yeah, at the end, it's, it's the most challenging one in terms of the standard extension and of, of implementation. Um, now to the middle column, break before make. Yeah, it's, it also um, provides robustness. Um, it has an initial flow latency reduction, so compared to the don't create, um, it's a little bit less efficient. Um, yeah, again, it needs some standard receiver modifications. It will need some standard extension, I guess. Uh, it's challenging as, as well. And um, we introduce some additional network overhead uh, because we have to reset all but one. Um, and then we have to proceed with the MP join again. Um, <clears throat> on the right side, uh, on the right column now, the, the timer solution. So it provides robustness as well. That is why we are doing that. Um, the implementation is, is pretty easy because you just have to do it on, on sender side. It's full standard compliant, um, yeah, but as already mentioned, less, less efficient um, in respect to, to latency and network overhead, uh, probably. Um, yeah, and we have a possibly latency increase by the, uh, such an approach. Um, did you define a question in between or? No, no, no. Okay. For now. No, no. Um, <clears throat> so we defined some, some criteria to evaluate our own proposals we, we made. And um, obviously, the, the important point 
the importance point is um, robustness and all of them fulfill this um, criteria. Um, then compared to MPTCP, so to standard MPTCP, uh, the network overhead should be minimized. And uh, that is true for proposal one and proposal uh, three, but not for proposal two, because we reset all the unnecessary um, uh, initial flows or potential initial flows. Um, the latency also compared to, to standard MPTCP should not be increased. And in the best case, we can also reuse it. And um, that is fully true for proposal one, because there we, do, we can or we will reduce the overall lat latency because the quickest path uh, or the, the quickest potential initial flow will win and establish a connection. And um, yeah, for proposal two, we will not increase <coughs> the latency uh, and we will have some little reduction. Direct question or should I first finish this? Uh, I have just. Uh... Later question. Hi, my name is Uma from Huawei. Uh, very good draft. I quickly skimmed through it. Uh, I didn't understand why you didn't put uh, MBB kind of in a make before break. Is it not applicable at all in this case? Or sorry, can you repeat the last sentence? Uh, we have this MBB right, make before break. Yeah. Was very heavily used in. I'm a routing background guy. Uh, so why not this is applicable here? First, you make the connection, then break it. So it. If I understood you right, that that is a proposal from from us, but we that is downgrade. That is the proposal one. The, we prefer the proposal one. That is that is just our view on that. But break before make it is also a proposal, and if you like it, why why not? So that is why we discuss it today. Okay, I will take it offline. I have specific on proposal two. I have some comment on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and with um, proposal three, um, we will most probably have some latency increase in the case if the default route is not working, and um, yeah, we will not reduce um, the latency compared to standard MPTCP. Yeah, the last point is standard uh, standard compliance um, that I have to explain a little bit. Um, so we assume that for all proposals, either we can directly incorporate with the existing um, MPTCP standard, or we need just a little, uh, we need just minor updates of, of the standard, but it's solvable from, from our view. So it's uh, for all of them true. <coughs> okay. Um, we um, decided to um, investigate a little bit more the preferred approach, the preferred approach for the downgrade approach and um, tested it first in a, in a lab environment. So we developed a prototype, we implemented in, in uh, the standard MPTCP in version uh, 0 and 9. And here you see this lab setup where we tested it first. So we have a uh, host A and host B, both are multipath capable. And host A has two interfaces where A1 is the default route and A2 is a secondary path. <coughs> Yeah, the, in the first test, the path that are both following, um, we introduced some variable packet loss on the default route. Um, we had no packet loss on the secondary path, and the latency was the same on both paths. And um, what you can see now in, on the left side, um, we show the average handshaking time over the packet loss of the default route. And you see for MPTCP, the average handshaking time increased tremendously over the packet loss. And um, with 100%, it's not possible to establish any connection. And with our uh, preferred approach, MPTCP rope approach, we call it uh, <laughs> the blue line, um, there you see normally it should be a stable um, average handshaking time, but because of uh, some imperfections of, of our current um, prototype, it's, it's not um, really stable, but it shows a good indication um, <clears throat> that we are much better than with the standard MPTCP in case if we have a problem on the default route. Um, 
now again the, the same test, but now we want to, sh uh, to, to show the latency benefit. And uh, the default route that we introduced um, 40 millisecond one-way latency. So no packet loss anymore, just the 40 millisecond one-way latency. And on the secondary path, uh, 20, 20 millisecond uh, one-way latency. So from um, theory, the handshaking needs um, three times the one-way latency. And that you can see now in the, in the figure. So for MPTCP, we have around 120, 120 millisecond um, handshaking duration. Um, so it, it fits to the theory. And for MPTCP rope, <coughs> we have 60 milliseconds because there we benefit from the secondary path, which is faster in respect to latency. Um, now a real world setup. <coughs> there we have on the, on the left side, uh, MPTCP capable client with two interfaces. Um, which is connected to an aggregation server in the public internet hosted by us, uh, where a transparent TCP proxy is running. And we try to reach a destination in, in the public internet through this aggregation server. Next. And um, in this setup, we try to um, download the 10 most popular websites and, and see what, what happens. Again, we introduced on the default route an additional 40 millisecond <coughs> one-way latency. So that means uh, the route, the default route between um, the host A on the left side and the aggregation server. <coughs> and on the secondary part, we introduced um, 20 millisecond one-way latency. Yeah, and what you can see now in the figure uh, is the loading time over the different uh, websites and the different approaches, the MPTCP or MPTCP row. And um, yeah, you see in nine of, of 10 websites, there is a benefit by MPTCP row. It's just in the case of uh, vk.com, um, where there's no benefit, but I assume again, that it is because of the imperfection of our prototype. Um, but the indication is, is clear from, from my view, it's much better with MPTCP row in respect to the overall latency and also the bandwidth because we have earlier the, the flows available. Um, yeah, first, some general facts. Um, MPTCP rope can protect MPTCP against network outages during the connection establishment. It can improve the user experience in terms of reliability and latency. Under most circumstances, loading times can be shortened by having maximum throughput earlier available. And we already did some uh, reference implementation based on MPTCP version um, 09. And now and that is the important point um, for me. That, that's a question I want to discuss with you. Um, is there in general a need for robust establishment? If yes, where should it take place? So I had already some discussion with Olivier and on the mailing list, and there was one proposal from his side to do it in the application layer, so in the responsibility of, of a developer. Uh, I personally don't like this approach. I think it should be in the MPTCP layer. Um, <clears throat> though that we have multi-path capabilities from the very beginning of an MPTCP session, um, yeah, the next question, won't we benefit from only robustness or won't we benefit from robustness and latency reduction? <clears throat> yeah, which approach in general fits best in future? So is it any of the third propo uh, proposals I present today or is there any other approach which can, be, which can fit? Um, how to integrate the MPTCP rope? into the MPTCP standard or the implementation. And yeah, how to develop or improve uh, the existing reference implementation and, and make it public available. How is the process if, you, if you're interested in that and, and so on. Um, but before I hopefully get some answers from your side, please the next slide and then we will return. Um, first, we have, uh, there's some detailed discussion um, about the downgrade approach we prefer because there are still some 
I will not say unsolved uh, problems, but there are some relevant points we have to discuss. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, in the in the downgrade approach, or it's the same for the break before make approach, we duplicating the thin request, especially the especially the the empty capable. So at the end, we we duplicating the key A, which is very important. And um, can you go back some slides to uh, to the beginning? Um, back 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 back. Um, no. Yeah, one, one back. Stop. Um, so, ah, no, to the don't get approach. Um, to, yeah, right. Uh, next, next, next. Stop. Uh, one back. Okay. Uh, one, one back. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> as, as I mentioned, we we duplicating the, the key A, and here you see host A and host B. So, it's pretty simple. But what happens if at the same time, there's a host C which try to reach host B, and by accident or by intention, it uses the, the, the same key A. What happened then? Then we have a problem. Because key A acts in the approach um, as an identifier that flows belong, belongs together. And there we need some solution to, to handle this. So please, back to the next, uh, last slide. No, yeah, before, okay. Um, so we have some ideas how, how we can mitigate the problem. So we cannot fully use it, but we can mitigate it, I guess. Um, so we can reduce the time frame where we allow allow new SIN requests with the same key A. Um, or we can use some remaining space uh, in the MP capable options, for example, um, to introduce some additional identifiers that is, that flows belongs together. Also, we have to solve the problem of the address ID, because from the MPTCP standard, normally the address ID is, is zero for the initial flow, and for all the others, it is um, it, it is then uh, negotiated. And um, but maybe that we can solve in the same way that we uh, introduce some additional information into the MP capital. Um, in general, there's a question, is there a need to negotiate rope support between client and server, or can we solve it in another way? How is it with a fallback mechanism? We have also, there are some ideas, but it would be too much now for the presentation, um, but it's it's an important point. And um, yeah, that was also a point from Olivier, so um, in the BIS um, draft, there's not any more TA in the MP capable which we sent with the SUN. Um, the last days I, I had the chance to review the draft a little bit, and I think uh, we can also succeed if we don't have a TA in, in the MP capable. Um, but that has to be discussed. And there are also some other approaches. Um, so there was from the NRCT at ITF 97 a proposal which is pretty similar to 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 our approach before make. No, sorry for our, to our downgrade approach. And I had already the chance two days ago to um, discuss with uh, Kian from from NICT, um, and um, we aligned that we have the same focus and maybe work together on on the draft or whatever. Um, yeah, and um, we have the API eyeballs, which can be implemented um, in the application layer, um, which is a possibility, but not prefer preferred from our side. Um, so now we can go back <coughs> and maybe we can discuss the questions or in general the approaches. Hi, I thought if we could go forward a slide, please, because this basically covers everything I was going to say, which is good to see you've. Uh, pick up on it all for example the IOTF 97 proposal which matched a lot of this but the biggest killer is of course there's no key in the MP capable in the BIS but the semantics of the key simply aren't aren't the same as what you're using you know it's a key the, the pair of keys for the entities once they're involved once it's set up have a semantic meaning but you simply can't assume that two keys on the wire from two 
random IP addresses are the same thing. I, as you say, you have identified that as a, as, a, as a risk, but I, as far as I can see, it's pretty much a showstopper more than anything else. But uh, yeah, 64. Um, but but yeah, for, well, especially for a, a malevolent attacker rather than an accidental one as well. So that's a concern. Um, but how I'm most curious, given you've identified all this, there's no point rehashing it, but I'm most concerned about how you see it working without the key on that last point. You said you, you said you had a way around it. So. Mm, um, yeah, okay. Um, so if you don't have the key A from the very beginning, so it's missing in the um, in, in the first sim. Um, yeah, obviously, then we don't have the information and we cannot use it as an identifier. Um, but in the last acknowledgement, we have both keys available. And uh, I think then you can make the decision on receiver side, for example. Because uh, so but, but I, you, I, but I assume the handshaking will be you, like that with, um, you wouldn't without any key. Yeah. You wouldn't have sent the same key B. Sorry? You wouldn't have sent the same key B. Right. So then, then we would uh, then we would replace um, or if you talk about not sending the key A in the soon, then we are not aware of it. And uh, host B, the receiver, will answer with different key Bs. Yes. Um, but at the end, if the acknowledgement arrives, again the host B then he can identify that flows belong together because of the key A, for example, or some other information, and um, then key B can be replaced internally. The, uh, security alarm bells are going off all over my head on this, and, and I've, I can't point to one just one thing, but I feel very, very uncomfortable with this. I'll, that's why I'll leave it for just now. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, Olivier Bonantian, I think I totally agree with the use case. So there are, there is a good motivation to do that. Uh, but my feeling is that looking at what has been done with API balls, because when you have IPv4 and IPv6, it's the same issue. You don't really know whether you should connect over v4 or over v6. There is similar work being done in the TAPS working group. So in the TAPS working group, there are there is work on an API where you can uh, let the, the a library or the API selects the good source address or selects the good transport protocol, and this is the same problem. And I think the advantage of doing that in the application layer is that you can have something which is generic for many applications running on the same system. So if you look at smartphones, for example, applications do not connect directly by using the socket, of the socket API. They have an underlying API, which is provided by the smartphone vendor, and it already takes care of you selecting which source address to use, depending on whether the Wi-Fi is available or the LTE is available. And so if you decide to use both, then you can use both in the API and you can use a timer with whatever value you want, but that would be part of the, and, and this is completely hidden from the application. So there is a shim layer that does this for you without requiring any changes to the protocol. So yeah. I think the use case is really valid and I encourage you to continue to work on the use case, but I would focus on looking at the application level solution because you, you get almost the, the good benefits that you want and the, the, the just the, the, the cost that you have is that you might open connections that are useless and that you reset already, but this is done by many applications, so this should not be an issue. And the advantage of the library is that you can remember what you have done in the past easily, and then you can avoid sending too many duplicate scenes. While if you put that in the kernel and the kernel would always, would always send duplicate scenes, then I would be concerned from a scalability viewpoint on the client and on the server side as well. I completely understand what, what you said, and that was also some argu uh, argu uh, argumentation you, you had on the mailing list, uh, I know. Um, but then it's only the case of robustness we, we handle there, and we don't benefit um, somehow in... But, but the then, then it's, up to the, it's up to the library to decide whether you want to have low latency. Because if you want to have low latency, then you just open over the, the parallel path and you get the yeah, connection okay. that you yeah. prefer. Mm, you are so, right, you are right, yeah. Okay, but then maybe we have some network overhead because we send several requests and all but one we have to reset. Yeah, but you can learn what is the, the yeah, network that, can, that gives yeah, you the best obviously. latency and so you have some yeah. overhead at the beginning and then, or you have some overhead on a regular yeah. basis from time to time, you just do the probing, but you don't have to do it for all connections. And you also need 
support in all the socket libraries. You need it for Linux, you need it for Mac OS, you need it for Yeah, but whatever. as I said, uh, applications will interact with the Shim library anyway, and TAPS is building this kind of library. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the NEAT project, they are, they are writing this library, which allows to select transport protocols, and this is more complex than just selecting the source address. So this is a su they are doing a superset of what you need. Yeah, but if it would be in the standard, I think it's more general. And all of them has to use it if there's a product. Yeah, yeah, but then, as Alan said, we have the security issues and the fact that there is no yeah, TA in the scene and things like that. If, if you talk about the timer solution, which is pretty similar, I think, to the happy eyeballs, um, then it guarantees robustness. Yeah. And But it is supported from the standard itself, and every person or PC or whatever which uses MPTCP has the functionality. If you only implement it in, in some libraries, then we, we rely on the support in the libraries. Yeah, but if iOS and Android decide to put it in their libraries, then by default everybody is using that. Okay, yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, Christoph Pasch, Apple. Um, I also want to say, yeah, this is really important work where basically it's really important to get a robust connection establishment. And in iOS, we have something that is called Wi-Fi Assist that is basically doing the timer-based approach. And to kind of reiterate what Olivier already said, uh, the advantage of the timer-based approach is that as it's sitting inside the library, it's also independent of the transport layer protocol. So whether it's MPTCP, TCP, whether the server supports it or not, mm. it just works. Like the application doesn't need to do anything. Mm. Um, and another point also with the timer-based approach is because of the t timer, you're not constantly racing Wi-Fi versus cell because you want to favor Wi-Fi and only use cell if Wi-Fi doesn't, really doesn't work. And you really want to avoid bringing up cellular at all costs because it has huge power implications but also implications for the carriers because they need to maintain state and so on. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for your comment. Um, but for me, it's the same. It's it's depending on, on the library, and um, yeah, I, I know about Wi-Fi Assist, and you all um, you already presented on Tuesday, and um, you need some time, I, I think, to detect that the Wi-Fi is not working. Well, I, I don't know how, how your algorithms work, and um, maybe we introduce a lot of delay to recognize that there is a problem. That that is that is a yeah, the the negative point of, of the timer-based approach from from my view. Yeah. But the question is, what we want to have at the end? Is it just robustness, or is it more? Hi, uh, Brian Trammell. I really like um, proposal one, but I share Alan's sort of security heebie-jeebies when I look at it. Um, we need actually to have serious security people throw some cycles at it to say that it's okay. The other thing that makes me less enthusiastic about it is that I don't see a um, partial implementation or partial transition solution to it. It's like we put it in the standard and then it's magically there. Um, you need to have some negotiation as to whether or not you're a modified receiver that can support protocol one. So that adds a whole lot more complexity. We have an enormous amount of implementation experience with option three, um, racing and timing. It's a little bit slower, but looking at the cost benefit analysis on okay, we get a little bit more latency for this much more um, uh, complexity. Uh, would this be done before MP Quick is done? Um, I'm not sure it would be. Um, with respect good, to good implementing... Point. Thank you. <laughs> with respect to implementing um, the timer in the protocol itself, in the MPTCP layer, it's worse than that. It's worse than just saying, okay, well, there's some efficiency problems because you're going to be doing the other racing anyway, right? So now you have two different layers also racing stuff. So you're going to race v4 and v6 at the at the library layer, and then you have it down to the MPTCP layer, which is also going to be trying to race different paths on v4 and v6. And it just seems like that's a really good way to get extremely confused. So if you're going to have racing, the racing stuff probably belongs in one place. And I'll reiterate um, Olivia's pitch for the work that TAPS and the NEAT project are doing on that. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. 
I think we ought to. Oh, okay, last comment. Okay. Yep. Uh, Anna Bernstrom, so I agree with the, the comments that have been on the mic already. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing, and that's it's also not the latency trade off is not so simple. So it's not necessary that you know using both the paths is always going to give you the best latency because if you want to have them both for robustness, you want to have them also for short flows. Once you get into the path being heterogeneous, it's not necessarily always a win. Uh. Can, can you repeat because I, I, I didn't completely get you. So what I was saying was that when you have two paths and they're heterogeneous, mm -hmm. uh, also if you just say, you know, I want to have both of them because it's always going to give me less latency, mm -hmm. that is not necessarily true because when the paths are heterogeneous, you may not want to use both of them. It may actually make it slower because you may get traffic on the slower path and it could dominate the completion time. Yeah, right. That's, that's true, but, but it depends on the scenario where you want to use it. Yeah, absolutely. Sure, but so I think you need to separate the robustness and the latency in that sense. I mean, it's not... At the end, I think if you have both, you can decide whether to use the path from the scheduler view or not, for example. So if a path returns first, which you don't want to use, then you don't use it. That is. Yes, but then you still have to wait to see if the other one yeah, succeeds, su succeeds, right? right. right. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's tricky, right. Thanks, Marcus. We need to move on because we're behind okay. yeah. schedule now. Quentin. Uh, so hello everyone, I'm Quentin uh, from UC Louvain and uh, this is a proposal for fast subflow creation. So, uh, so why do we propose this? It's the fact that, for instance, uh, current implementation typically uh, initiate a connection and then they create subflows on all pairs of uh, IP addresses. And this is great for bandwidth aggregation, but in the case of, for instance, smartphone, this is not useful, and in fact, this can be worse than what we can uh, we want. In the sense that you will establish subflows that might be useless because you don't have enough data to to send, or because uh, in fact uh, you don't need uh, bandwidth segregation. Instead, in the case of the smartphone, you rather want to have a low latency and yeah, seamless. Uh, network handover, so when you leave the, the Wi-Fi, you want to switch on the cellular in a seamless way. And useless subflows, useless cellular subflows consume energy consumption and radio resource allocations. Uh, yeah. So, for instance, where with the smartphone use case, suppose that you start uh, with a smartphone which is in a, a Wi-Fi network that works well, the, the connection is established and so on. And then, uh, next, please. and then uh, you decide to move, and you reach. You have, uh, you are in a in a zone, in an area where you are losing your the Wi-Fi reachability, and so it it becomes uh, lossy. And then, in this case, you want to have an additional subflow in that case that will use the cellular, and you don't want to use the cellular if you are on a Wi-Fi that works well and and you don't need uh, bandwidth aggregation. So next. So in fact, uh, this work come from a technical report that was recently published. And so we have three uh, mechanisms to enable this on smartphone. In the case of the ITF, we will focus only on the last, uh, on the last proposal because it is the only one that affects interoperability and so uh, so this is why we will present the multipass CP option to do that. So next slide. So the idea is, in fact, we want to have a break before make approach at the subflow level, and we want to delay the creation of the backup subflow in the in your case the cellular subflows. So yeah, this is nice for um, uh, radio resource allocation for energy consumption, but yeah, it's a kind of reactive ap uh, approach. And so you have 
you need some time to detect if you really need to create a cellular subflow. And so you can have larger latency. And yeah, you don't want to have too high latency. And this is annoying uh, in this sense. And furthermore, uh, establishing subflows in multiple CP takes some time. So next slide. As shown here, actually, when you want to, you have your, your smartphone that has data to be sent. And you want to create a new subflow, you have to wait to RTT before actually sending your data. And so, yeah, if uh, the latency of your cellular network is quite high, you will wait much, you have, have an increased latency, which is annoying. And so, uh, yeah, if we could create subflows in a one RTT or even in a zero RTT fashion, it would be nice if we could uh, do some kind of TFO, but at multipass CP level, using multipass uh, connection information to establish this subflow, it would be great because you can send the data in the scene and then you can have the, the answer just after the SYNAC. And so in, it's uh, just the latency of using sending data on the cellular if, in this case. So next slide. So if you take the case of uh, request response traffic here, we, we made simulation with a mini, a mini net topology. And so we look at the latency experience by, by the application. Uh, when you lose the first pass and then you try to, to send your data on the second pass, the backup pass. And we see that uh, compared to the classical joint uh, way of doing things, you, you earn at least one RTT, you save at least one RTT when requests are quite large. And if the request fits in the scene packet, in fact, you can save two RTT, the two RTT of the establishment of the subflow, which, is, which could be nice. In fact, so next slide. So about the proposal itself, the concrete proposal, we want to, to have two, addition, two additional uh, multipass CP options. A first one that would create a subflow when you want to send data. So uh, typically when you have a request response traffic and the client detects that your Wi-Fi is bad, and so you will send uh, your data directly in when creating the subflow. Or another option when uh, you want to create a subflow, but the client has not data to send, but it knows that it has data to be received. For instance, you are in the middle of a build-up road, and for some reason, this is uh, the, the subflow, the connection of which uh, you are uh, receiving data is lossy, and you want to say, okay, I think I will open the cellular and see if I can continue my transfer on the cellular. And this is the case for the, the other one. So next. So uh, this is kind of a proposal like we, we implemented it in, a, in our uh, technical report. So this is the option we, will, we should use in the scene option to create, um, to create uh, quickly a new subflow. So compared to the multipass uh, MP join option, here are the following things. The first one is that we will include the data sequence number because you, you need to know which data sequence number the data correspond to. Uh, of, of course, you need to have a data level length like in the DSS. And because of uh, security consideration, you want to authenticate in some way your subflow, and so you use IHMAC, truncated to four bytes. We will discuss this after that. And so to compute the, the HMAC, you can use the token of the connection and the DSN uh, of the data you want to send. So next. And this ENAC, in fact, can directly send a HMAC, compute it over the, the DSN and the data hack that, uh, that is uh, present on the connection. So next. And uh, we have a, a, similar, a similar way of doing things with uh, when you don't have data to send, then you use the data hack itself and you, com you can compute a HMAC using the data hack and uh, the token of the connection. 
and similarly with uh, with the CNAC, we use the DSN of uh, the, the flow. Yeah, so next. So of course, this introduces security consideration. The first one is that in uh, the in uh, the MP join, I think it's eight bytes and then twenty bytes of the HMAC. Here we we shorten, especially in uh, the fashion out option, the HMAC to four bytes because of TCP space, TCP option space consideration. Of course, we can modify it, but this is uh, mainly to fit uh, in the Linux implementation of TCP. And the second thing we we should be aware of is about seeing reprior uh, attacks when you have the DSN, you have the data, you have the HMAC, so you can replay uh, uh, the packet on another subflow and create additional subflows with the same packet if uh, you have seen this packet in the network, which is quite annoying. And so we can say, okay, the server should limit the number of subflows that are created for a specific DSN over a specific connection. This is uh, a possible way of uh, mitigating this. So next slide. And so uh, to conclude, in fact, this is a proposal to tune multipass CP itself to fit a smartphone consideration because, because of uh, the case of the cellular and, and uh, the mobile nature of the smartphone. And uh, we are we actually implemented this solution uh, with uh, in, inside uh, MPTCP uh, 0.91 and in Android uh, 6.6.1 6 uh, on Nexus 5. And so uh, is there any interest to follow up this work, at least at the ITF? Is there any follow-up for this proposal? This is the main question, in fact, for, for this presentation. Hi, this is Uma. Uh, we are look, looking at low latency applications for a couple of use cases in 5G and related. Uh, 5G requirement is one milliseconds, but we don't go that far. But you know, uh, the low latency is very, very important topic. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask, what is the comparison after uh, subflow creation and with your changes? The? What is the what is the gain you got with this uh, with your approach? With, with the classical uh, multi uh, with the classical and with your additions. Okay. Um, in fact, this we, we made that in a, in the paper. Uh, we showed that uh, for kind of interactive traffic, you can reach similar performance. Yeah, uh, uh, slightly induced latency, but not much more than classical multi CP with the backup mode. So the reduction is significant or not significant, the latency for the subflow? The, the latency remains quite the same. Okay. It's just that uh, you don't have uh, the cellular which is established uh, useless. Okay. Uh, so, so if you establish a cellular, it's only when you need to use it and actually you use it. Okay. Thank you. Any more comments? Alan Ford, I'm a little, I may have just not followed it as you're saying it, I'm trying to. Um, in your options when you send them in the scene, so before there's any data, yeah. what are you actually signing with the HMAC? Because you mentioned signing data acts and data sequence numbers and so on, but there's no data in that packet to sign, the data comes later. Uh, not sure. data, data doesn't come till the third act. If you're sending data out, the first sin doesn't have data in it, presumably. In, in the in the version in, on the version out. Uh, out, as in you, you're the one who wants to send data. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is to use the, the data in the HMAC. Or we can could use the uh, the data. Uh, the, the yeah. mm, what's the data sequence number referring to there? Uh, the, data, the data sequence number of the connection of the data you are sending in the SIN. Okay, but uh, are you sending data in the SIN? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, sorry, right. That, that uh, yeah, was, yeah, it's a, sorry, it's a, that it's a, a kind of TFO, but that's multi-pass. Okay, yeah, yeah. all clear, yeah. all clear. That was a bit I wasn't too sure on, because I could see how it worked in the ladder diagram for the other way, okay. but not this way. Okay, cool, fine. Anna Brunström, so I'm curious about the impact on delay between your detection mechanism that you actually need to establish your new subflow in relation to the the cost of setting it up because I guess if yeah the, the magnitude of those two are kind of important I guess to see the whole picture on the latency or yeah in fact the the impact will be clearly visible if you have your main network which has low latency and your additional network, which is high latency, will have a much more, uh, much higher impact because, in fact, uh, the time you will have to, to create your subflow will be saved in some way. But yeah, when when this is comparable, yeah, the, the all all is uh, about having a good detec detection system, which is yeah, we propose one uh, in our work, but yeah. You, you have indents latency because of the detection, and yeah. I won't stand up. Um, so would this be a change to the base spec, or is this an extension that could be done later? To for the, me, to the protocol bis spec. For me, it's just adding two two options, so it's like an extension. It's only an extension you can have. But it would change the security properties by having this reduced stage mode. Yeah, for that option, yeah. Um, Christoph Pasch. Um, I think it's important to that we speed up the handshake and that we can send data early. But for this particular use case, like when when cell is down and idle, it takes a very long time to bring it back up again. And then basically the Handshake is kind of in the noise. Um, so I'm not sure if the gains that we see, we, we would really see them in the real world deployment. Um, and then uh, maybe a little bit more technical question is, uh, it seems like we are missing the DSS checksum here. Maybe, oh, is the data level length able to cover middle boxes? Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, we, we didn't include the, the DSS exam, but we could. Yeah, we could. Okay, thanks, Quentin. It sounds like this is something that needs more time for people to think about and discuss, but I've taken the message that we can go ahead with the BIS without worrying about this because it's something if that it's an extension. If that people think that's wrong, then we need to <laughs> come to conclusion on it before. So we're up to Christoph talking about um, some thoughts about documenting interactions between MPTCP and TFO. Now do we have some slides? Do you have slides? Or do, are you going to show yourself? Okay. Can you send it to, send it to me afterwards so I can avoid it? Yeah. So apologies, this one is not uploaded, but we'll do it soon. Hello. So um, this is basically more of um, like a request to revive an older draft. It's basically the draft that uh, Sebastian Gregory and Olivier wrote a few years back about the interactions between MPTCP and TFO. 
Um, the draft is not suggesting any wire format changes for MPTCP. It's mostly documenting uh, how one would implement an MPTCP and TFO uh, uh, MPTCP stack. Um, and it basically boils down to two recommendations. One is uh, on the TFO cookie size, because if we have MPTCP TFO and all the regular TCP options, then we need to basically make sure that the TFO cookie is uh, small enough so that everything fits with inside the SIN. And the second recommendation is about the data sequence mapping for the data that is inside the SIN. Um, because it basically suggests to have the data that is inside the SIN to not be part of the DSS mapping, and the details are all in, inside the draft. Um, MPTSP plus TFO has been implemented in uh, Linux for RFC 6-day 24 uh, by Gregory a few years back, and it has been used, as far as I know, by uh, many people. Um, when I did the implementation of the, the BIS draft, I made sure that it works with MPTSP plus TFO as well. And in iOS, we have it implemented also. So my request is kind of, um, can we maybe um, revive this draft or even maybe even include it inside the BIS document? Uh, for, I just wanted to say that I'd love to see this in the BIS, but that requires someone who isn't me to write the text. That requires what, sorry? Someone who isn't me to write the text. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, we will help. Cool. So any comments on the idea of including it, rather than who's going to do some writing. Michael. So this is Michael speaking as TCP I'm sure. I haven't attended multiple CP for quite some time. I just think we have to think in TCPM about whether we should move this at some point in time to standards track. And I'm not sure if this would be of interest to the multipass TCP working group. So far, TFO is experimental. If there's input on, on that from the multipass TCP working group, that would be something we in TCP would probably be interested in. Um, I've actually been discussing with Yushung of moving uh, the TFO RFC to standard structure. Yeah, I know. Work. I've also had quite a number of discussions. It hasn't happened so far. As a personally, I think this is what should happen. But uh, we have to think if we make it happen. But as I said, for this working group, it's mostly if you have input on that, then please raise it on TCPM. So we heard one comment in favor of including this in the bit. Are there any other comments in favor or against or uh, concerns? How many people feel ready? Oh. Uh, sorry, I just saw there's a question from Yoshi in the Java saying, uh, do servers use different cookie sizes for TCP and MBTCP? That is completely implementation dependent. Um, in the Linux implementation, it just decreases the cookie size to four bytes for all TFO connections we could simply change it to make it dynamic based on whether MPTSP has been requested or not. Um. I think there are two different ele elements in, the, in the, the slide that Christoph brought. So the first one is there is a recommendation on TFO cookie size, but this is related to the size of the TCP header in the SIN. And so as we move to 68, 24 bits, the requirements on using shorter cookies will be less strict than what it was with 60, uh, 68, 24. Oh. That's one issue. 
But the second issue, which is really specific to MPTCP, is the importance of looking at the data sequence mapping for SYN data. And so we, we might say that the TFO cookie size could be in or out of this document and could be in another document. It could be in a generic a TCPM document where they recommend that when whatever size you do should fit with the options that you use in the SYN, because that's basically what, what needs to be done. And then there is a data sequence mapping, which is really specific to MPTCP. And I think this part should be in the RFC 6824 BIS document. The cookie size is just true. an implementation detail. I mean, true, true, agreed. Yeah, in the BIS we actually really don't care anymore. In the BIS we have less issues because yeah. the MPTV option is only four bytes. Yeah. So is is anybody against trying to include something on these lines in the BIS? Uh, I guess, sorry, please hum if you are against. Um, please hum if it's too early to make a decision. You need some more time to think about it. And please hum if you'd be in favour of including something on these lines. So there's some noise on the on being in favour and not on the other two. Um, so I suggest that uh, Christoph, you and Olivier work on on some text, uh, and then we can discuss some specific text. Um, and if you can try to do that in the next couple of weeks, something that would be cool. Oh, sorry, uh, Julius. Excuse me, Julius Krabacek, just a quick clarification. There was a question, I don't remember who at the mic, saying that the TFO is experimental and MPTCP is standards track. Is that a problem or not? Yes, so the, the, the intention is for the BIS to be standards track. Yeah. Um, and TFO being experimental, is that not a problem? Michael is Michael is approaching. Well, well, I'm not the best expert for these kind of things, but uh, as I said, I think I think there is a certain interest in TCPM in thinking at least about the standard track thing. So, if uh, MPTCP would require a standard track specification, that I think TCPM could do something. So. So are we saying that if MPTCP standards track TFO remains experimental, that causes a problem for some of this? Or I, I think I've interpreted your initial thing as just your initial comment as a plea. If you think TFOs should be standards track, please come and say. No, no. I think the, if there was a problem, we could fix it in TCPM. Okay. I thought, I thought I'm aware there wouldn't be a problem with this. Well, me I can probably answer, but it's informative in this draft, so it should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Says that's correct. There you go. <laughs> okay, so I think we have a plan. Thanks, guys. Um, so, Quentin, you're back on the IPv6 only host. That's So it's, sorry, just before we start, has anybody not signed the blue sheet? Has everyone signed? There's one in the, one in the back corner, thank you. Um, and remind me, we do to finish at 20 past? Yeah, okay, so perhaps five minutes because I'm a little bit tired to wrap up. Uh, yeah, quick. Uh, so, due to the availability of the ITF NAT64, uh, here at uh, at the ITF, we decided to play a little with it. So it's nice. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so let's take an example. In fact, of you have a client which is behind on that fix for and is, has only an IPv6 address and a server which has both IPv4 and IPv6 address given by two different networks. Makes sense. So uh, you can start initiating a connection on V6. So you will do the, the DNS request, you have the IPv6 uh, address. Next. You send the SYN to the IPv6, then you receive the SYNAC, everything goes well. So next. Then you receive the ad address in V4. And next. And so what should the client do? Because today there is no real way for the client to detect the embedding of the V4. So next slide. So the, in fact, the client receives an IV4, but it is V6 only. And the conversion of the embedding of the V4 address into V6 is actually done by the DNS reservoir of the NAC64. And performing the conversion in the, uh, of the address in the NAT64 is probably a very bad idea because uh, we don't want to have middle box, additional middle boxes doing funny stuff. And uh, you could have additional problem due to the TCP uh, option space because an IPv6 address is larger than an IPv4 address. So next slide. So what we can do instead is to try, the client could try to infer the embedding in some way. So uh, for instance, uh, here, uh, we, we are using at the ITF the well-known prefix, which is here. So when we receive an IPv4 address, it's quite easy to try to assign to that embedded address, and it's implementable. It's, uh, it was done, it, it works, it's nice. The only issue is that NAT64 can have the well-known prefix, but also network specific prefixes. And the, uh, inferring network specific prefixes is quite hard and it's quite key in some sense. And maybe a way to solve this is to, uh, to rely on a draft that is currently done, which uh, could uh, allow the, the, the NAT64 to, by, uh, via the RTHCP to communicate the embedding of the network specific address, the network specific projects. And that. Yeah, this is Mohamed Bukada. Yeah, it, yeah this, this is actually this is a, a generic problem for each time you have a protocol in which you have referrals. So um, there used to have RFCs, which are we have defined already means to discover the proxy, which is which is uh, used by the NAT64. You can see, for instance, an extension which is defined for the protocol PCP that you use, for instance, to for uh, to to interact with the NAT64, and then you learn the list of all the prefixes of the NAT64 because you may have multiple NAT64 in your path. And then it gives the ability to uh, to provide this kind of prefix to uh, to to the host, and then you will do the the other synthesis based on the RFC 60, 50, 52 on the on the host itself. So this is a generic problem. The the DHCP one is not is not an option because there is a recommendation from the behave working group to not go with that with that way. That means that yeah, because various issues with the DHCP itself, it does not allow you to discover, for instance, um, if you have multiple NAS64 in a single network. Uh, with one single uh, DHCP option, you don't have this limitation, and there is actually one RFC which go through all this list of uh, alternatives to discover the prefix, and the DHCP option was discarded by the Behave Working Group. So, the only proposal, the only RFCs in this not track which we have today in the, is the, uh, the PCP, and this is um, really um, a problem which is shared by all the applications in which you have the address referrals. Julius Krobachak, I'm going to use some strong, strong vocabulary here, so I would like all the miners in the room to leave before I do. Um, there is one possible point of view that NAT64 is a hack that doesn't belong in the internet, and I'm still hoping that, more re that there will be some, a sudden outburst of common sense and people will be using things like MAP-E that don't have the problems that NAT64 has. I'm wondering about the wisdom to accommodate for NAT64 broke, um, uh, for NAT64 within MPTCP. <coughs> yeah. Just one quick comment uh, to uh, to Jalice. Yeah, you you see map E and map E there is a NAT in the CP itself. The only difference there is that there is a port restricted NAT in that CP, and you have the same problem to to 
to get in for the communication for a host which is located behind the CPE, <laughs> even if you have the map in the network side. So the NAT will be always there. You have firewalls and the problems are there. So I don't think this is the opportunity to, to, uh, to say this is bad or not. This is the, the situation we have today. And the NAT64 is really uh, deployment in many networks and multiple customers, millions of customers are enjoying the service to have the IPv6 and the IPv4 service continuity so that they, ca they can also join to the majority of the servers which does not support IPv6. So NAT64 is, a, is, is something which is really helpful for, this, for these people and this is really a good, a good problem to, to be solved. So what the comment is how to solve it, it is not specific to MPTC but that's another way, but this is not something that we should to say against NAT64 and so on, but anyway. Uh, Olivier Valentier, I agree that NAT is a mess, but if we believe that one day we will have IPv6 only networks, then we will still continue to use IPv4, and so NAT64 is one way to get that. And the message for vendors and for network operators is that if you deploy NAT64, please use the well-known prefix, and there is some hope that we can cope with that with MPTCP. If you use any of the prefix, then I guess nothing will happen and we won't use the NAT64 prefix in MPTCP. So if I get it right, this has no impact on the BIS protocol document. This is uh... not not really. No, J okay. it's just to to, to highlight an issue with the highlighting network a problem. Network. It's okay. just uh, playing with experiments and yeah, yeah. very good. That's it. Uh, Christoph, um, I, I just want to confirm, confirm like that this is a really big problem where uh, we are, when uh, the device is on an IPv6 only network and uh, previously we were on an IPv4 only network so we only have an IPv4 address how can we establish a subflow over the IPv6 only network and we are doing in iOS we are doing a lot of uh, synthesizing and desynthesizing of of the IP addresses to basically extract if we started on IPv6 only we extract the IPv4 address out of it and the other way around um, and so even if they are not using the well-known prefix, we basically figure out what the prefix is by resolving IPv4 only dot ARPA, and uh, that way we can basically use use uh, MPTCP on whatever network there is. So I, I think I maybe even think that this could be uh, documented in the biz. Okay, um, I, I'm. I'm very happy with this, and it's kind of an informational thing. It doesn't have any wire That's impact, it. does it? Yeah. No, I mean that sounds great. If you if, if you can write something that people like in the near future, then that's that's great. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've got about one minute left. So I'll just summarise where I think we've got to today. So if I remember right, we're going to um, we've at least here agreed well, to confirm things of course that the MP prio which is a, we're going to make the modification that we uh, talked about which is a wire change uh, we're going to have this TFO interactions uh, stuff which is more informational and maybe something on what Quentin's just talked about um, and we're going to try and try and uh, get the bis in its sort of um, we thought it's been in a stable state for a while, but <laughs> we keep making the odd change to it. So when ho hopefully this will mean it really will be stable in the next month. I guess all of these bits of text can be done. Uh, and then we're going to work out how to push it up into uh, ISG land and wider review. Um, we obviously have to do a working group last call first. I'm assuming, Mia, do you want to make any closing comments last minute? You're happy? Okay, right. Thank you very much to everybody. We've used our time up. It's the end of the IETF. Congratulations. Uh, see you or hear you in Singapore. Bye-bye. Thank you for all the good discussions and contributions. And if anybody didn't get the blue sheet, anybody sneak in? <laughs>